factors. And so let me get to that. That's the exciting thing about why you're all here tonight. Um, we have a couple of presenters from the watersheds on the Big Island. There are three uh, major watershed partnerships here on the Big Island. Obviously, in the islands that we live in, fresh water is incredibly important. And tonight, uh, we have with us Jake Merkel from the Kohala Center, and we have Cheyenne Perry uh, from the Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance. So we're going to start. Cheyenne's going to kick us off tonight. Um, our speaker, Cheyenne, he was born on a Oahu and grew up in Waianae, so very dry, and here we are talking about watersheds. But he comes to us after uh, spending some service in the U.S. Army and attending college on Oahu. He eventually graduated here on the Big Island from UH with a bachelor's degree in marine science, and I'm excited to say that he's a fellow Pipes alumni. We both did the Pacific Internships Program for Exploring Science, which is a great uh, internship if you're out there as a young person interested in going into natural resources. Um, and that gave him the opportunity to work on Oahu and study uh, mangroves with the Forest Service. But Cheyenne is really connected to his native Hawaiian ancestry, and his ancestors are actually from the districts of Puna and Kau here on the island. So he really felt the pull to return here. He even married a Hilo girl. Um, and so his roots are now here on the island where he also got a master's degree from UH Hilo in the Tropical Conservation Biology Program. And he's managed forests for OHA at Valcalio Puna, the Hawaii Experimental Tropical Forest uh, for the Forest Service. And he's now been with the Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance for 10 years, which Cheyenne, that kind of blows me away because I knew you before that and I didn't think that our kids were that old, but apparently we we, big now. we, are big. we used to talk about our babies, like what is what happened? Uh, yeah. That was a long time ago. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a huge watershed that supplies all of our fresh water to Hilo and the surrounding communities. And so your work is just so critical and important. And with that, I really like to turn it over to you, Cheyenne, to share with us tonight um, cool. about the Kia watershed. Thank you, Franny. You know me so well, I must have sent you, I must have sent you something. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share screen. We'll get right into it, but uh, basically um, what, what I'm going to talk about is um, rapid ohia death and how it's affecting the um, upper watershed for the Wailuku River and Hilo. So I'm going to share screen right now. And mahalo for that introduction again. Um, and so I kind of started with this idea. This is a olelo no eau or poetical saying, um, kahe kawai ula kua kea ka moana. And basically what that has to do with is that when you're seeing that the, the waters are running brown, then you know that the sea is, is kind of white with, with foam. And so like what we're seeing from a management kind of point of view um, is that the, uh, we're really seeing the signs that our ecosystems are, um, are, are in for some challenges for many different reasons. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is the initial management of rapid ohia depth. I'm sorry, it's kind of blocking my view. I'm going to kind of reduce the screen. Uh, rapid ohia depth at the Wailuku River Headwaters, Hawaii. Um, the coordinator for the program um, started in 2011, and then we have a, a small field team that we augment at times with more people, but it's about four folks right now, four people. Uh, Russell, Marco, Shane, and, and Willie De La Cruz. Um, the image that you see on this title slide kind of shows what um, what P.E. Honua um, looks like, the upper part of the P.E. Honua Ahupua. And you can see a lot of these trees have um, are kind of defoliated. And we've kind of seen a drastic change uh, um, in live trees over the past year or so. So this was taken in September of last year, 2020. Uh, and this is on Hawaiian homes. If you look a little bit further, you'll see the, the gorse population off of Mana. Uh, that's about 5,000 acres in size. Uh, but we are gonna talk today about ohia and um, rapid ohia death, uh, the fungus, ceratocystis. Wait, oh my. So we are part of the Hawaii Association of Watership Partnerships. There's 10 of us across Hawaii. We've got, um, together with those partnership lands, which include state, um, federal, and private lands, um, over 2 million acres that we're helping to manage. On our island, um, we've got three uh, watershed partnerships, Kohala Watership Partnership, Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance, and Three Mountain Alliance. Uh, the Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance, um, you can see that kind of polygon in the middle of the 
image on the map for Hawaii Island. Um, that's about 500,000 acres. But we all have kind of the same, um, same mission to protect um, water quantity and quality, um, as well as overall forest health for the purpose of providing, um, you know, for source water. Uh, this is what our partnership looks like. The, uh, it's around partnership lands on Mauna Kea or a little bit over 400,000 acres. These are the um, land holding partners. So we've got, you know, the state of Hawaii, uh, Parker Ranch, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Hakalau Refuge, Kukaiao Ranch, uh, Kamehameha Schools, and Queen Liliokalani Trust. Um, and then we have another three partners, so a total of 10. Wait. Hold on. So it includes our affiliate partners that are uh, not popping up, but that includes the Nature Conservancy, Pacific Islands Fish and Wildlife Office, and the Institute of Pacific Islands Forestry. So a total of 10 partners with our watershed um, partnership. And I, I know everyone on here knows that Ohia is foundational to our native forests. Um, it's very prevalent throughout our Oli and Mo'olelo. Um, Ohi means to gather. And so it's one of those trees that is um, the first on the, um, after a lava flow and starts the process of uh, beginning, a, beginning a forest for that area. Um, it's used for many different things. Uh, probably one of the more, um, the things that kind of pop into my mind um, include making and carving ki'i, so images, but also for, um, um, for different parts of the heiau in the building of the heiau, um, just to show the, to illustrate kind of the, its sacredness and its value. Um, it is a mother of our Hawaiian forest here, uh, close to about a million acres of ohia dominant forests on Hawaii, in Hawaii. It's also a shelter and habitat for um, native things. Um, and it provides this kind of invaluable watershed function. Um, it is very, um, ohia is very, um, is perfect for Hawaii in the sense of um, gathering water. One of the cool things, I'm looking at the scientific name Metrosideros polymorpha um, in Latin. So what that actually means is um, iron heart of many forms, for those who didn't know. Uh, but recently we've had rapid ohia death um, happen on mostly on Hawaii Island. Um, that has been confirmed to be um, two different ceratocystis species on our island, including Luku ohia and Huli ohia, um, basically two different types of strains. Um, if you look at the image on the left, you can kind of see a, a micro view of what ceratocystis looks like. It's a fungus. So you can see kind of um, individual trees that pass away from the fungus. They basically get girdled from the fungus. It, it stops the movement of resources um, to, feed the, to feed the tree. Um, and you have kind of this characteristic uh, uh, passing away of the tree within a very short amount of time, but still kind of having intact leaves and still looking like an ohia tree, but just brown. You also have the, the smell of um, rotten fruit or, or bananas when you, um, when you take away a little bit of the skin. And then that classic spalting along the edges of the ohia, of the ohia um, limb or tree. And then this is kind of at the micro scale, this is what the fungus looks like, really interesting looking. But then if you go at the macro scale, we start to see um, what it looks like within a native forest. We have a lot of these, the dark green being live ohia trees and then these brown and um, light brown and dark brown trees being um, trees that are affected by um, rapid ohia death or ceratocystis. So just a general timeline for those that are not super familiar with, um, with rapid ohia death. Um, started around probably around 2009 and 2010. There was this report of a new disease. Um, there was a bit of time that was taken to try and figure out if that was related to ohia dieback. Um, they found out eventually that it was not. Uh, 2012, um, about 4,000 acres or so were affected and that was mostly in the moku of Puna um, here on the eastern part of, Mount, um, of Hawaii Island. And then by 2014, another 16,000 acres um, and then within that time frame of 2014 and 15, it was identified as a ceratocystis as being the, the reason for the rapid ohia death. And we can kind of see from this map on the top, kind of the movement. Um, it might've also had to have been um, determined by the monitoring techniques. Um, but by the time we started moving on it in 2013, kind of a smaller populations in Pune, um, but we start to see that it's moving out of Pune and then by 2015 and 16, we are getting positive um, results from 
um, other parts of the island. And then by September of 2016, we're seeing that about 50,000 acres are, um, are being affected. And then a little bit more refinement in the, um, where the rapid ohia death is seen or uh, potentially rapid ohia death until it's tested. Um, and we start to get more of these polygons so we can start to estimate a little better um, versus the waypoint data. Um, and then by December of 2017, we're starting to get a, a fairly clear picture of what's happening on our, on our island, uh, Moko Kiabe. Um, and then in 2018, it's confirmed on Kauai, and then in 2019 on Oahu and Maui. Um, although those, those populations are small, and from what I can tell, they're, um, they're the Huli type variant, which is not as aggressive. Um, and in Maui, it sounds like the tree that was, um, the, or um, had been identified was, was, um, was cut down. So. Uh, but generally, the, it's a, a very, um, it's a major challenge on, on our island of um, Hawaii. And then this is what it looks like um, as of June 2020 on Hawaii Island. So we're going to kind of look at uh, more closely this area. So these are the, all the headwaters of the Wailuku River on Hawaiian homes, um, going down into the Hilo Forest Reserve. Uh, just another view of what that looks like. So this is a, um, a gap classification. It's a little bit on the older side. I think the imagery was around early 2000s. Um, but you can see just generally, you've got the grasslands. We've got um, these reds, which are um, exotic timber, mostly. Uh, and then we've got on the eastern part of Mauna Kea, we have this, these gorse populations and then open Mamane and Koa, but most of the Ohia and Koa are kind of in these belts here. And then kind of in the middle is um, mostly uh, kind of a more closed Ohia forest. And again, we're gonna concentrate kind of in this area, which is the area we've been working in. So, so what are we kind of doing about it? So it's, it's conceptually, it's a very, uh, it's a pretty big challenge to watershed. Um, but what we're doing, I'm fairly, I'm convinced that um, the, the reason these things are happening has to do with the overall health of our, of our forests. And so see, these are some of the on the ground actions that we do um, to try and um, um, help our forests to be more resilient. So we constructed a Waipohoihoi management unit. Um, it's about 1100 acre management unit. Um, we installed fence around that area, removed um, thus far a, a little bit over 700 feral animals from that from that 1,100 acres, um, including feral cattle, feral pigs, and feral sheep, um, through mostly passive means. So that means we use these um, kind of these one-way gates with feral cattle. We've also used a lot of drives, and we've been working very closely with a con uh, contract person with Hawaiian Homes that's been removing feral cattle from the from this area, and actually um, taking some of those feral cattle down to the different Hawaiian homelands um, for them to have as food and meat. Uh, we're also controlling weeds in the management unit area. Uh, we're monitoring so we can kind of get an idea of what our actions are doing and how we can improve them. Um, and then we're just starting to start our restoration. Our numbers um, as far as feral animals within the unit are low enough. So we're gonna start to plant this year. And um, the way we keep connected to our community, although that is affected by COVID-19, is we do huaka'i or journeys, uh, field trips to these different areas. And so this is one of the areas that we can um, we can um, help, you know, help to facilitate any of our local communities out there. And then we also kind of are helpful with helping with workforce development and supporting local jobs and hiring local folks. Uh, yep, so we got here, we got the fence line. This is on the, the south side. You can kind of get an idea of the forest. What the, it's mostly, it is Ohia dominated in, um, in the area we're working in. This is from, um, you can see at the top right, there's an image of the, of the feral sheep. And this is during a drive, a helicopter drive. Uh, pushing them towards a wing fence, and then they'll go out the unit through a, uh, a double gate. And then at the very bottom, this is a one-way cattle gate where um, we kind of palu on the outside of the unit, and then the, the feral cattle move out that way. So mostly passive again. Um, th these images are courtesy of Brian Tucker. We've been trying to figure out how to really tell this story effectively for folks that are not um, regularly on the on the Mauna. Um, this, these images kind of are, are the first kind of stab at that. Uh, we've been working with Brian to kind of figure that out. Um, but this is this here kind of going down. This is the Wailuku River, the named Wailuku River. Um, and then we just kind of picked a little site within that. This is all Ohia Forest. 
And we can kind of see the change between 2016, although the imagery is a little different. 2016, it kind of have this dark on the bottom left, you got a, a dark Ohia forest, uh, lots of greens. And then when we come to 2019, when it's really last year, I think was really, um, was really rough for the Ohia forest. We start to see a lot of the, um, but we, we do see that there's a lot of changes in our Ohia um, and defoliation. Um, so we are making management, uh, we're making a strong effort to try and protect those, um, those watershed um, areas um, at the headwaters. Uh, we conducted an aerial survey for feral cattle and a rod. Um, this happened in um, March of 2019 to kind of get an idea. Um, so we used a forward looking infrared and then also a regular visual camera with um, the SDAV out of UH Hilo, spatial data analysis. Um, and so you can see this image includes both of those um, surveys in one. So those, all those purple dots are kind of the, the feral cattle. And um, the larger the dot, the more, um, the bigger the group. And so you can kind of get an idea just from this one image, um, kind of how the, where the cattle, feral cattle are, at least in that morning, um, and then kind of how they're distributed around the unit. Um, and then on top of that, we also had them look at suspect rod trees. So we, from that analysis, they came up with 53 suspect trees, which we are currently testing. Uh, and then this just gives us a look at what that looks like just with the suspect trees that are infected with rapid ohia death. So this is a really interesting thing that um, because of the situation that's happening there and we're, um, and we're starting to manage this area, um, it can, it's a really good area if we want to start looking at how uh, managing for forest health might help with resilience when it comes to funguses and other, other things that might come in and pathogens um, that might come in and affect our, our, our native forests. We are working with the USDA Forest Service and also the Big Island Invasive Species Committee um, to look at rapid ohia death. And so these are kind of our, um, kind of the last information that we got within our unit area. Uh, and this is, so this is after they've tested these different trees for the ceratocystis. Uh, so as of March, 2020, we can see, um, although some of them did look like they were infected, they were not. So those are all our green dots here. So not detected or at least not detected. Um, but we do see that some did come up positive for um, Luku Ohia, uh, kind of along the Southern boundary er areas. And then a little bit along this edge here, I should mention that the Hakala Refuge is, is just north of us and the Hilo Forest Reserve is just east. Yeah, so we got some pretty, um, so we are identifying where the, um, which trees are, in, are um, potentially infected. And we can kind of look at if we are managing an area with, with no feral ungulates within the unit area, does that create a more resilient forest to rod? And then um, recently also in February, 2020, they, the Forest Service put in some permanent plots to study the uh, mortality from, the, um, from rapid ohia death. Right, and so um, this kind of wraps it up. So we are managing for healthy forests um, and how that relates to water and our future as communities that live on the island. Uh, these are some of the future actions. Uh, I think one of the, the primary things foundationally was to kind of have a, a, the Aina Mauna legacy program plan, which is a hundred year plan that I think is always good. So we're not looking at a four-year plan. We're not looking at, at a six-year plan, 100 years. So we're looking, really looking outward um, to try and um, make sure that the management is, is effective. Um, PE whole, whole new offense inst installation. So that's kind of helping on um, Hawaiian homes. Um, and that includes some feral cattle removal. Um, and then we also have, uh, you know, those questions, healthy forests are resilient to rod. So for research, we have this area that's being managed so we can plant, um, Ohia trees from Ohia C that has shown to be resistant to, um, to rapid Ohia death. Um, or we could plant different types of Ohia um, to see if they're resistant to rapid Ohia death. And then kind of in the, the, the larger picture of it all is kind of looking at climate adapted um, kind of planning processes where we can involve all the different folks that are um, in that area and affected by these same things that affect our watershed and health. And I really do believe that the that our watershed health and the health of our forests is, um, is directly linked to our health as, as humans within these communities. Yeah. yeah, so that's the area we're kind of working in right now. And that's about the 1100 acre um, management unit. Um, and then 
potentially there there may be some room for um, for more restoration and native uh, managing for native forests in those areas. Oh, Alamai. Uh, and the last slide. So my name is um, Cheyenne Hiapo Perry. Um, this is my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm Cheyenne Hiapo at gmail.com. These images were um, mahalo to Akuli Kamara. He let me borrow these. Um, but these are images from Shiraki Paddock, which is another area um, that was just fully fenced recently, about 200 acres. Um, and we can see some of the regrowth from the ohia trees and small ohia trees kind of popping up in the area. So, you know, I think with the right um, kind of management actions, uh, Konohiki type, type actions, you know, inviting possibilities um, that we have a really good shot at kind of getting ahead of this, but it does, we do need to pay attention and we do need to try and make the, the right moves when we can um, as a community. Right on. Well, mahalo to everybody. Uh, that concludes my presentation. And Thank you so much, Diane. That was that was excellent. I, you know, it's really, I think it's really important that people understand, you know, the the work that's going into protecting that fresh water source. And and I like what you said about our health being connected to the health of our forests. It's it's re really easy in our day to day lives to be disconnected from. Um, such an important source for our lives. And I know that you have, a, for very hardy folks out there who want to be a part of this effort, you have a couple temporary positions open if folks are yeah. interested. Yeah, we're hiring, um, we're hiring a small, um, something like three to four person team. That's a kind of a temporary team, but they're just going to um, help us with some of the work we're doing on Mauna right now. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Anybody so out know, there, yeah. if anybody knows of anyone? Anybody or needs, needs work? <laughs> Yeah, get out there and help protect our watersheds. If you that you get to see some amazing places, having been on some of those hookai with students, it's just it's awesome out there. Um, is there any questions on Facebook, Jade or Molly? Is anything that uh, we want to hand off to she Cheyenne right now, or we want to move on? Uh, there is no questions on Facebook. Okay. Same with Zoom, no questions. I guess Cheyenne explained oh, it perfectly so everybody understands. <laughs> well done. Well I'd, like done. To, I'd like to think that. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that's what happened. <laughs> You're a good teacher. Yeah. Okay, so that, uh, <laughs> thanks again. Um, we're going to have Jake speak now. We're going to move to the other side of the island to the Kohala watershed. And Jake is... He's tuning in tonight all the way from the other side. And he he actually also, he grew up here in Hawaii, on Hawaii Island, um, but from Puna Hamakua, which is, you know, we're over here, in, I'm in Puna tonight. Um, but Jake really connected with the forest in a deeper way when he was just 13 years old, collecting Miley with his uncle in the Pu'umaka'ala Natural Area Reserve. And if you folks haven't been out there, it's incredible. That's where the alala were released this past uh, year. You know, they're really trying to make that habitat. So really incredible forest. And Jake, it's just wonderful that that was, you know, you, you credit that with opening your eyes to these plants and creatures that are found nowhere else in the world and that you hadn't known before. Um, um, until you got out there. And so uh, Jake is was so from childhood so inspired that after he graduated from Kaal High School, he began an internship with the State of Hawaii Natural Area Reserve Program. And that turned into a permanent position as a field technician, which lasted over 15 years, but really led into a leadership role, which is what he's brought to the Kohala Center for the last two years as a field crew leader. So he's organizing field operations in that deep forest, five person crew to protect and rehabilitate large sections of the Kohala cloud forest. So Jake is taking some time out of that cloud forest. I, I'm assuming you were in the field even just these last couple of days, Jake. So I really appreciate you taking the time tonight to, to be online with us and talk to us about Kohala. Right on. Uh, mahalo for the introduction, Franny. Um, yeah, aloha to everyone uh, that's watching and tuning in. Um, and mahalo for uh, taking the time to you know, um, see what this is all about, see what uh, Hawaii forests um, and what's going on out here. So mahalo and um, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen and begin my presentation. Um, my presentation is uh, coming from a, a field crew perspective um, on ginger control in the Kohala cloud forest. Um, and it's, a, it's gonna be a bit different presentation than uh, what Cheyenne had. It's a pretty short one. Um, just kind of introductory to um, how ginger, also known as um, Himalayan ginger, or here on the islands, um, 
Kahili ginger uh, and how it affects our forest. So just hang on a second and I'll share my screen. Okay, hang on a second. We'll look at a beautiful forest like that. <laughs> That's just gorgeous right there. <laughs> okay, hang on. I just got to figure out real quick how to start my presentation over. Okay. Oh, that didn't work either. Okay, that should work. All right. So, as I said before, um, just going to be touching on uh, Himalayan ginger in the Hawaii cloud forest. Um, I have a lot of borrowed images in here. Uh, this is an image from Maui. Uh, they have uh, a lot of the same things happening in their forest uh, and their cloud forest with Tahili ginger. Um, and I just wanted to say real quick that um, it's known on the island um, as kahili ginger because it looks so much like the, the native Hawaiian kahili. Um, and through you know the last few years, um, I've learned that by linking that kahili name to this non-native ginger, some people tend to get a little bit confused. So um, the Kohala Center has started using um, Himalayan ginger when we're describing the, the ginger. So just wanted to make that clear. And you can see the, the kahili there um, that our queen is holding. Um, and you can see the similarities um, in this slide here with a blooming um, head of one of the, the Himalayan ginger flowers. So um, ginger was brought to Hawaii as an ornamental. Um, and I just learned that it was propagated um, here as early as 1930. Um, and you can see why it's a, it's a beautiful plant. Um, smells beautiful unless you are out there um, chopping it down all day, it gets intoxicating and nauseous, but um, it, is a, it is a very nice, uh, very nice flower. So, okay, so why is Himalayan ginger bad for Hawaii? Um, it alters the native forest ecosystems in Hawaii. Um, it gets in there and it totally changes the understory. And if left to um, its own devices, it's um, you know so such a dominant species that it'll shade out all the, the seedlings. And those those seedlings would one day grow up to be you know dominant forest, dominant trees, and dominant dominant understory um, native species. But the ginger is so aggressive, it shades it out. Um, and eventually those old growth trees die off and it's nothing left but a ginger understory. And it doesn't give any chance for um, younger trees to come up through the, the thick leaves of the ginger. So um, it smothers out those younger seedlings um, and it completely prevents the forest regenerating. Um, it's amazing how, um, how dark and gloomy it is underneath a patch of established ginger. Uh, if you get under there and you're you know, cutting away at it, trying to get rid of it, you look up and you can't see barely any specks of sky at all. So it's pretty amazing. Um, it spreads through uh, rhizome growth. So each of these uh, stems from this ginger plant has a rhizome at the bottom. And it kind of, in my mind, it kind of grows like a, how, a, how a centipede has all these links in its body. It has all these links that just keep continuing along and crawling above the ground and rooting into the ground. Um, and it creates this dense mat of root matter. Um, and so it spreads through rhizome. It also spreads through seed dispersal. Um, there are some non-native birds that eat those seeds and ingest them and you know poop them out and they end up all over the island. And the ginger um, can actually grow in a whole you know, wide, variety of, uh, of ecosystems. It can grow all the way down near, near sea level. Um, and up on Kohala, I've seen it, you know, way up. I think the highest up I've seen it is something like a little over 5,000 feet, if I remember right. Um, 
So it's spread by birds, spread by the rhizomes, um, and all this just takes over so rapidly and diminishes the biodiversity. Um, and the ecosystem begins to break down. You don't end up having all these, these lush native uh, Hawaiian plants. You, you end up having just a, a monotypical understory and eventually it'll be the overstory. Um, okay, so another reason why Himalayan uh, ginger is bad is the, the native wildlife are heavily affected because um, their habitat is diminished and also um, their food sources. So it's not only the, the vegetation that is negatively affected, but it's also the wildlife. And in turn, of course, it's, it's gonna affect everyone on the island, including people, so. Um, this image here is of a fairly pristine uh, part of the, the Kohala Cloud Forest. Um, this is in the Pu'o'umi Natural Air Reserve. And um, as you can see, the biodiversity is pretty amazing um, compared to the, all the, the ginger photos that I've showed you so far. Um, you know, if you really stare at this photo for a while, you can just, you know, pick out just tons and tons of things and even more if you're actually there and experiencing it. Um, and this is the same image that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Um, this is a, a, you know, a ginger forest. It's, there's, you can see some eucalyptus in the background and maybe a, a ohia tree struggling to poke up, but it's, it's dominated by mostly ginger. So I'll just uh, go back real quick. You see the difference there. There's a, there's a pretty big difference. And I, and I wanna clarify, these aren't images of the same place. Um, they're just uh, examples of what cloud forests look like in two different situations. Okay, so I'm gonna go into what the guys are doing on my crew out in the field. Um, so we do ginger removal just about almost almost weekly, um, at least you know once a week. But this week, like my my guys and I were out there two days this week um, doing ginger control. And in the beginning, it's really fun. You get to you know pretend to be a samurai and chop ginger down and um, it's it's really fun to chop down it's really easy it cuts really easy um, but it gets old and um, so I'm going to just talk about the method so the hardest method to get rid of ginger is digging and hand pulling um, pretty easy to do if you're dealing with a, a juvenile plant um, even juveniles though it's hard to get the whole root system out of the ground um, they they get aggressive pretty quickly and they can survive after you pull them, you know, if you put them up on a, uh, a wooden fence post or a rock or, or something, it's, it's amazing how long they can survive without touching soil. Um, so really, if you're digging up and hand pulling, you either have to bring the root systems out with you and dispose of them, or uh, one method we use sometimes when the patches aren't too extensive is we actually bag them up in contract bags and just tie them up and leave them. And months and months later, we'll open it up in the the roots will be rotten enough that we can dump out and reuse the bags. Um, that's a very um, labor intensive method for removing ginger. And it also disturbs the, uh, the soil and the root systems of other native trees. And perfect, you know, to have Cheyenne presenting on, on rapid ohia death, if you disturb ohia roots, it makes them more prone to, um, you know, getting some kind of pathogen just like ceratocystis. So um, it's not a good idea to disturb root systems of, of native trees. So, you know, um, there's no real way of avoiding that if you're removing ginger and digging them up in a native cloud forest, you're gonna, you know, unknowingly disturb root systems of other species. So um, the most common way that my crew and I remove ginger is with a cut and spray method. We go out with machetes and we um, attack clumps of ginger and we um, apply a escort, a 0.1% escort solution with blue dye. And in the image, you can see some of the blue dye there, um, just so that we know which stems we marked with, uh, with the herbicide. Um, and also another method that hopefully will um, be the go-to method for removing uh, Himalayan ginger will be with a uh, biocontrol. Um, I'm terrible at saying Latin name, so I'm not even gonna try. You guys can practice saying it. Um, but 
these um, these biocontrols, um, this one in, in specific that I, I have listed is also known as um, Granville wilt when it occurs in tobacco in other parts of the world. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've been in conservation for a while and I've never actually seen um, really great effects of, of any kind of introduced um, biocontrol on ginger. And um, I'm sure there's a, a specialist out there somewhere that can talk more on, you know, how, um, how the biocontrols are evolving and how, how that's playing out in the conservation community in Hawaii. Hopefully we do have an effective biocontrol that doesn't negatively affect any native um, species on the island or, you know, for that matter, any, um, any kind of croplands or anything like that. And that's, that's where biocontrol becomes real tricky. There's a lot of um, scientific research that goes into biocontrol before they're released. So at the moment, it's still a cut and spray method for, for my crew and I. Uh, so the image here on the left uh, is one of my past crew members, um, Johnny Victorino. Um, so he's standing with um, a clump of live piggly ginger, um, Himalayan ginger. And you can see the, the orange um, on the tops of the plant. Those actually, after the blossoms have um, become pollinated and, and they have a viable seed in those little orange packets. Um, there's, you know, per, per plant, you know, there's not a ton of seeds if you compare it to something, um, you know, like fountain grass where there's just hundreds and hundreds of seeds on one seed head. But all it takes really is just one seed to get consumed by a bird and carried 10 miles into a perfectly pristine section of forest and, and dispersed and then it all starts right there, um, spreads from there. So um, in front of Johnny, there was a, there's a patch of ginger that had been cut and sprayed a few months prior. And we were revisiting the area to expand off of that treatment area. Um, the area on the, the, sorry, the image on the right there, that is uh, an image of kind of what it looks like when, you know, the bulk of the, um, the understory is, is taken over by, by Himalayan ginger. So get a, it's a kind of a good visual that it just, it's, it's really extensive uh, how, how much the, uh, the ginger can spread. Um, all right, so that uh, pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, hopefully it's not too short and sweet, but um, you know, uh, it's just more of an introductory to ginger. So feel free to um, ask questions if you guys have any, um, and hopefully I can answer them. And I, I imagine Cheyenne or anyone else on the, the BISC team can also answer questions of tons of knowledgeable folks here. So, so yeah, mahalo everyone for watching. Thank you so much, Jake. That was fantastic. And just being able to take us into that cloud forest, that was awesome. Um, this is really beautiful. Uh, it's interesting what you had brought up about um, biological control. I didn't realize there was a biological control potential for ginger. It would be amazing to have the sort of the low cost passive way to control spread. So um, thanks for sharing about that. I have to learn more about it. Uh, Jade or Molly, is there any questions coming in that we need to pass on to our presenters? Uh, no questions on Facebook. Okay. Biocontrol, I just have to comment, would be so exciting and so promising because that could be the one thing that really saves our watersheds. When you get that thick blanket of um, Himalayan ginger rhizomes, water cannot percolate into the watershed. We, we did have one comment about the common name and a lot of us like to call it toilet brush ginger now because it looks like a toilet brush and it's not good for much more than cleaning your toilet. <laughs> nice. That's a new one. That's a new one to me. I like it. Okay, good. Perfect. Let's, let, let's make it a thing. <laughs> um, we have another question from JB. Oh, sorry. Well, years ago when they were discussing the Ralstonia for biocontrol for ginger, the edible ginger growers were worried that it would spread to the commercial ginger. Is that still a worry? And do you hear any pushback from ginger farmers? Well, um, 
I don't know if it's still a worry or not. Um, and unfortunately, I'm out in the field so much that I really haven't been keeping up to date with uh, how they're coming along with biocontrol and all the research that's gone into it. So unfortunately, I can't answer, uh, answer that question, but um, maybe someone else here can. Yeah, I'm sure that's, that's the key research that has to be yeah. done before a biocontrol can be released. They'll have to test it on all of the commercial gingers as well. So that's that's an excellent uh, point. And was there something, another question, Molly? There's nothing else, just that I was also commenting. The state of Hawaii would not put out a biocontrol that would ruin any um, any crops or plants that we have here at all. Like we are not going to get a biocontrol that's going to host jump. That's the last thing we want. Exactly. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A. Um, has effectiveness monitoring been completed on the areas targeted for removal? So how is that, uh, how's the removal work go, Jake, as far as like, do you go back and see if there's still continued spread or what's, what's happening in the understory after you've done the removal work? Yeah, that's that's a that's a really great question, actually, and I and I should have touched on that. Um, so, it's actually um, two or three times more work than you think it's going to be. Um, for instance, uh, you know, say if you take a, a 500 acre unit and the whole place has ginger, you sweep 500 acres, which would take years and years and years with a crew of my size. Um, you, you got to assume that after sweeping all those 500 acres, um, you're going to have to go back in and revisit those treatment sites. And you're not going to, you're not going to kill every, you know, rhizome the first pass. You got to expect that it's going to take two, three, four, maybe even five visits um, before you can really you know, knock it out of the park um, and, and make sure everything is, is dead. And then you, you still got to worry about reintroduction of new, new seeds. So really, I mean, I'm praying that it uh, comes down to effective biocontrol. Um, monitoring, uh, my crew and I, you know, we, at least out in Kohala, um, we haven't been working out there on the Kohala ginger per se for very long. I've only been with the Kohala ginger for two years now. Now the, the Natural Air Reserve, um, we were revisiting sites um, just, uh, just about on a, I think it was like a quarterly basis. Um, going back retreating and there was always something every time you went back there's always something there's a lot less every visit but you could never just throw in the towel and um, so so monitoring is key if you walk away from it for from a few years and don't go back you're, you're sure to see the same thing as when you first started You're on mute, Franny. You just noticed that. <laughs> so thank you for it. That's a very good answer. Um, and I think that anybody who's worked in with any of these invasive plants knows that that's, that's always the challenge. Um, continued revisiting of those sites. It's a lot of work. Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, oh, then I just oh, want to... Wait, oh. we do have another. Sorry. Go ahead, Molly. There we go. Sorry about that. We do have a question for Cheyenne. Okay. Is it DHHL's plan to remove all the feral mm -hmm. camp cattle off the Ina Mauna lands? Um, so the it's a little bit of a controversial thing um, with the um, the feral cattle that are up there. I mean, everyone probably on here knows that they were were introduced by Vancouver uh, as a gift to Kamehameha One for the first, and he had put a a couple on them um, for about 10 years so that people could not um, eat them. But, but another part of that story was that the feral cattle was getting so out of control, they were actually breaking into people's gardens and eating the, their food. And so the, um, the, the, the Makainana um, had to create um, different paws. So they actually built fences around their garden, their mala, to protect the food that was within the mala. Um, I do think that Hawaiian, so Hawaiian Homes right now, they have a couple of um, contractors that are removing feral cattle from Humuula and Pii Honua Mauka. Um, and I, I do think that the intention is to really reduce and um, feral cattle numbers. But it is the, um, we have been in talking with other folks. So like domestic cattle, for example, 
um, don't seem to have the same kind of effects on the forest that feral cattle and feral cattle does. So domestic cattle is probably on the better side because they're being provided with nutrients that they need and they're, you know, they're being, they have feed and stuff. Um, so they're not um, barking as much. And so the main, the main issue we're having with um, rapid ohia death um, is the wounding. And so most of us that work up there, we can see it. We walk in the forest every day. We can see the wounding that's happening either through barking or from rubbing up against the trees. Um, although it's not really clear how much like of a percentage of an area, how much of an impact the, the feral um, animals are having. I mean, we could, it could be storms, you know, anything that can cause breakage or open wounds on the, on the, on the tree can potentially, and then that provides a vector for the rapid ohia death to get into. Um, but I, I do think that they really want to um, reduce the amount of feral cattle and are open to, um, it would be a different story if it's domestic cattle and being managed, managed effectively. And, you know, we do have a really um, close relationship with a lot of uh, Paniolo and talking with them is really amazing because the um, management is, there's a lot, um, there's a lot that, um, it's a well-studied um, program. So like um, managing domestic cattle is, is something that um, a lot of people have a lot of mana'o on and it is very, it's a life, it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of, a, and looking at, a res, you know, the different resources that are available out there and providing food for, for our people. So yeah, um, it's been interesting because when you start, when you're really in this kind of field, then you start to see like, well, oh, it doesn't, it's not that cows are bad, but, um, if they're feral cattle up on the, in the, just where the, by virtue of their location and the damage that they're doing in the rot and rapid ohia death is happening, those things are potentially all linked. So yeah, we are seeing that it's a much more complex, you know, it's not as easy as saying, oh, this is bad, this is good. There's a lot of gray area. Um, so we really try and operate in that. And um, we're just trying to do the right thing, you know, the right phono thing. But yeah, I do think that Hawaiian homes is really, um, it's been thousands of feral cattle that have been removed from the mountain over the years. Yeah. And we, yeah, if you ever have a huakai with me, we can go over the whole history of um, feral cattle on the Mauna. Yeah. And I'll just give you the information. I have been chased. <laughs> yeah, I've ahead. been chased by those feral cattle there at the DHHL lands doing yeah. forestry pots. And like, had to, we'd have to hide by big ohia trees and just wait till they left. Yeah, they're different. They're we have a scary. protocol. Yeah, we don't mess around. No, they're scary. They, they're legit yeah. scary, those cows. They're not. They're, they're not, not the you, cow that'll come up and lick you. No, <laughs> yeah. they're not domesticated. No, that's not them. <laughs> um, but I do recommend uh, if you do get to go on a hukai with Cheyenne and Mauna Kea, it's it's worth it. And Cheyenne's such a storyteller, so you get a lot of um, awesome stories. I know you terrified yeah. my kids with ghost stories when we were up there with oh, my yeah. coolers. Absolute when new ones. <laughs> <laughs> that was, it was awesome. It was great. Um, Molly, I think there was another question. One more question for Cheyenne. How can people apply for this position? Your, you know, your job. Found, oh, go ahead. Call them Yeah, just your job. The, the job, you know, you're hiring three people or. Yeah, so we are. Um, so we're looking for temporary folks. Um, do, the way it works with the, with the way we're hiring is it's a 20 week hire. And it's a team, so we're looking for a leader and a couple of field assistants. But if you can um, email me, you can email me or call me directly. Um, so Cheyenne Hiapo, I'll, I'll type it into the um, the chat screen. But just you know, just get a hold of me, and um, we can talk story. Great, thank you so much. Um... Okay, one last chance. Anybody on Facebook have any questions? Anybody in Zoom? We got some thank you. We're saying yeah. mahalo to, to Cheyenne and, and Jake for a very interesting and exciting talk. I have I do have one question on Facebook. One second. Okay. Let me bring it up. Um basically like what's like what are you guys doing with the, the cattle once you catch them or something? Like are you like you said, you did mention like the, the gated, the one-way gate, but like what happens to the cattle? Yeah, so um, so the way, so we've used, um, we have a license with Hawaiian Homes. It's a 10 to 15 year license that was approved by the Hawaiian Homes Commission uh, to work in that area. Um, we've used mostly passive. So what that means is that the with the one-way gates and the one-way gates are actually pretty effective. Um, what you do is you, you have kind of a trail that the cattle normally use before you put up the, the management unit. 
and you place the gate there and the, 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 the cattle is pretty much used to moving back and forth in that area. Um, and so they'll just leave the unit and then they're outside the unit. Um, the contractor is actually, he comes out and does trapping. Um, so what he actually does is remove the cattle live from the area. And he takes them down and sells them at the Filipino markets. And he also gives some of them per his license to the, um, a few head, I think it's something like maybe a couple, a couple to five head, maybe a month to the different Hawaiian homes, um, beneficiary communities. And so he just takes them live and then the communities actually bring people and they, they process the cow right there. And then, you know, get the meat prepared and then send it out to all the different people that are within the community. Um, the, he has different um, things that he has with his license, so he might have to do it differently. Uh, but for the feral cattle, that was the primary way we've done it. Um, with the feral sheep, we've done um, mostly drives. And so, which, because they're kind of a herding animal, it's challenging because we have forest canopy. And but, so we use the helicopter. Um, and then, you know, it takes about an hour and you can remove about 80, 80 feral sheep in an hour, you know, 50 to 80. Um, and then um, those are most of our methods. And we also do some trapping for feral pigs. Um, but for the most part, most of those, um, if we can do it logistically, we, we get that meat out to different, um, to different communities. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so the way that um, Sheldon actually does it is with the drives, he's the, the, the DHHL contractor, is he actually drives the animals against a wing fence that are, they basically covers about 25% of the unit. Drives them Makai down to the wing fence into a trap and then takes them up with a bulldozer and a trailer and trailers them out and all the way back down to Hilo. Yeah. And he wow. was having a lot of, he, he actually was able to do bookings. Um, you know, the one of the things that is needed on Hawaii Island is more, um, more slaughterhouses or more areas, yeah. more places that can process because that's a choke point. What often happens is the smaller, um, the smaller guys, the smaller Paniolo groups, they're not able to maintain bookings to get to go to the slaughterhouse for the, to, for the, the food to get processed. Um, and so like in recent years, maybe the past two or four years, they started to um, actually take them directly to the communities. And it's actually, it's, it's, I, my brother happens to be in one of those communities and they, um, they get 10, 10 to 15 guys go down there and they teach the younger folks how to, pro if anybody's ever processed the cow, it's not easy. And it takes a lot of skill and a lot of, um, a lot of people, a village. And so he gets, they all get together and they yeah, he gave me this ridiculous number. What was it? Something like five cows in like two or three hours or something. I was like, what? But yeah, so yeah. So, you know, the I think the way Hawaiian Homes does it is really is is pretty pono. Um I think know, as far as fantastic. getting the meat out to the people. Yeah, it's fantastic that they're taking that, you know, it's an invasive species that they're removing, you know, for the sake of the watershed, but they're also using it as a resource and you yeah. know, feeding people. And it's so important, especially yeah. now in this time. Yeah, and I have received that beef um, in a roundabout way from my brother, so I do. I have tasted it. <laughs> oh, so you're up there doing all this fencing to get them out, and nobody just hands you a nice T-bone. I mean, yeah. you hamburger. So he'll he'll pass a hamburger my way every once in a while. He's all like, "Hey, this is from my hometown." Yeah. Fantastic. All right, is there anything else, Jade, from Facebook that we should address? No, but I think we got it all. Okay. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you guys so much. And thanks for the discussion. Um, I think it really is, is great to have these questions because it opens up into other areas that weren't covered. So we really get like a lot of a perspective about the different issues. But thank you, Cheyenne. And thank you, Jake, for being sure. here tonight. And thanks to my team for Thank you. Questions. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for joining us on this webinar, one of the final webinars of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. We are in the final voting for the worst invasive <laughs> species on Hawaii Island. It's, uh, I think, the last day. So if you go visit our, our BISC Facebook page or BISC Instagram, you get a chance to vote for your your favorite worst invasive species. So with that, happy uh, Invasive Species Awareness Month. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, everyone. Aloha.